One of the questions I get asked all the time as a songwriting teacher is whether it's actually possible to teach someone or learn systematically how to get better at songwriting. And I understand where the question comes from. I think that there's still a lot of mystery around songwriting. And I think people believe that it's something you're either inherently born with or not. Um, but it turns out that regardless of where you fall on the sort of like natural inheritance of musical talent, there's always things that you can do. Hmm. to get better at anything and songwriting it turns out is no exception to that. So in this video what Benny and I want to share with you is one of the most significant ways that you and I and Benny and anyone can get better at songwriting and that way is to learn from other songs and so what we want to show you in this video are six songs that taught us how to write songs. So should we get into it? Let's do it. Okay. So the first song that I want to show you is a song by an Australian band called Leonardo's Bride. And the song is Even When I'm Sleeping. And this was a hit in Australia and mm, possibly huge, in the world huge. in the 90s. What we're actually going to do is play for you the song. And then after we've played it, I'm going to explain what the principle is in this particular song that taught me something really significant. Go. Two, three, four. I learned from this song is really chordal. So the first thing that happens in this song is what's called a line cliche. So let me explain what a line cliche is and then I'm going to have Benny demonstrate it again. So a line cliche is a chordal maneuver whereby you hold the chord steady. So the triad in this case, a D major triad that it starts on, stays D major triad, but there's one note in the chord that moves in chromatic steps. So in this case, it's the fifth of the chord, which is the note A, which is moving down in half steps. So the song starts on a D major triad. Then that A moves down to an A flat. And then it moves down to a G. And then it goes to a nice A dominant seven chord. Okay. So that's a line cliche. A line cliche is when that chord stays stable, but one note in the chord moves down in chromatic steps. And it's such a beautiful part of chord stuff. I just love it. And not only is there one line cliche in this song, there's two. So in the little um, musical interlude between the chorus and the second verse, mm. there's another line cliche. Will you play it for us? Mm. 
Ooh, so that goes from an A major chord. Okay, and then this time it's not the five moving, it's the root of the chord. It's the A that moves down. To a dominant flat seven. To a flat seven. Okay, so it moves more than a half step here, but it's still a line cliche, okay? And then it moves down a half step to the six. And then it moves back up to the dominant seven. So it's that A note, it's the one of the chord that is moving down and then back up. So again, it's the same concept. You're holding the chord stable, but one note of the chord is moving. So let's talk about wanting that for a second, because it's mm. one thing to hear and learn someone else's song, but the real thing that is what we're trying to convey as songwriters is how to transform that into something usable for you without just ripping something off. One thing with chord progressions to know is you actually can rip a chord progression off. I mean, you can't copyright a chord progression. That doesn't mean that you should do it, right? For example, the chord progression to Creep by Radiohead, for example, is so distinctive. <laughs> to write a song in that key with that exact chord progression, mm. it would sound a bit rippy offy. There are some systematic ways you can take something that you've learned and love and turn it into your own. So one thing to do is change the key. Another thing to do is change the tempo, change the time signature, change the feel, right, the way that it's being played, the mm. actual rhythm of mm. the chords. And of course, once you have changed the lyrics and melody, um, it's going to sound like a different song, particularly if mm. you're not copying the whole chord progression of the whole song. It's just that one little mm. bit or snippet or a couple of bars that you enjoy. The feel one is a really important one, just to quickly give a demonstration of that. If we just did that even with nothing else changing, if we went... that's got its own thing now and you, yeah. that would be hard to say oh that sounds just like creep because yeah. the feel is so different so yeah. it really is one parameter that you can change that yeah. that makes a huge difference well said thank you okay so speaking of radiohead great segue nice uh i want to talk about karma police karma police is a song that i have been obsessed with since i heard it whenever that was and i'd say the whole album the whole okay computer album for me was life-changing. We could pick any song from that album and, and analyze it, but we're, we're analyzing Karma Police. That's what we're doing. And a couple of things that changed my view of songwriting when I heard Karma Police. First of all, this idea of the beautiful 16 bar intro with all the chords that you're going to hear. And they've used these beautifully placed borrowed chords. And that was the first time I guess my ear had heard a borrowed chord strategically placed, a non-diatonic chord inserted in such a way that it grabbed your ear and said, hey, this is something a little bit different. Also, when you look into the chord progression, uh, it's hard to tell what key it's in. It seems obvious at first, it seems like it's going to be in E minor or G major, but there's also a really strong pull to A because it starts on the A minor. So there's an A Dorian kind of vibe. And without getting into the complexity of it, what they're doing there is they're creating this ambiguity about where the tonal center is, which is just such a lovely, space to swim in if you can create this kind of intrigue just using some interesting borrowed chords and some interesting progressions. So I'm going to play that intro and mm. you can hear what it's talking about. So we've got this this idea of So let's talk about what chords are in this progression. We start with an A minor, and we move to a D over F sharp, and then we go to an E minor. And that, in a way, feels like a home base. Mm -hmm. It feels like we've arrived at a home base. But then we go up to the G, which is the relative major of E minor. So you could really say, you know, E minor, G major, we're kind of in that in that space. And G minor and sorry, G, G major and E minor are just the relative. They're the major relative of each other. So you've got one after the other. And then the second time round the chord progression, we have A minor straight to an F chord. 
Now, where does that F chord come from? Because it is not diatonic to either no. G major or E minor. So if you were saying we're in the key of G, you know, it's a flat seven. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of flat seven vibe. If, if you're in, you know, in E minor, it's, it's creating a Phrygian sound, which is, so it's a modal kind of sound in Phrygian. That F really kind of jumps out at you and, and your ears more than anything tell you that that doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. When we say, you know, it doesn't belong, it's beautiful, but it's... Mm. And this is the power of a great borrowed chord, I think. For me, what I learnt from this song was, you've got essentially 16 bars of music, but you've got one borrowed chord mm. that is so beautifully placed that it creates all of this momentum for the rest of the verse to unfold and it's so interesting mm. you know if you have 16 bars of just purely diatonic intro it's arguable you know it's going to be hard to keep people with it mm. so that diatonic sequence is going along just fine oh. mm. so beautiful if you want to know more about modal borrowing you can check out the video there yeah. It's a bit more motor borrowing. Yeah. So the second amazing thing about this song is really to do with the structure. It kind of flips the script on its head a little bit. We, we talk, generally speaking, about the chorus being the big moment. Uh, the big, you know, look at me. This is what I'm about. This is what the song's all about. And generally speaking, I think a lot of artists would go bigger in the chorus. More instruments, more layers, more dynamics. It's just... It's just bigger, generally speaking. Radiohead in Karma Police go the other way. And again, it's something you don't hear very often so that when you do hear it, it, it really makes an impact. So you've got that. So this is the end of the verse. And then the chorus goes. This is what you get. Borrowed chord. This is what you get. This is what you get when you mess with us. So the very understated way that chorus comes in kind of grabs you and says, "Wow, that's not what I was expecting." It, it, it's it's so it's so understated that you almost feel like they're tricking you. It's kind of like when a teacher in a classroom of rowdy children gets their attention, not by yelling louder and louder, but actually by whispering. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, yeah, all the children are quiet. Yeah. Mm. It's amazing. And sectionally, this song is unique. It, you know, it has this beautiful intro. It introduces the borrow chord. It brings back another borrow chord with what is a very diatonic, you know, chorus. C. D, G. Can't have it more diatonic. Mm. And then hits you with a G flat. It's like, okay. And it's those little moments that are just sprinkled in there that create so much interest. And finally, you, you have these beautiful uh, verses, these, you know, subdued or stripped back choruses before it hits you with the bridge. And the bridge, for anyone who's ever heard the song live, the bridge is the big part. The mm. bridge is epic. The bridge is more than two minutes long. It's the part where everyone starts swaying at the concert. It's like they've turned the bridge into the outro and mm -hmm. they've made it anthemic. Mm -hmm. And again, this kind of flips, you know, the, the traditional way of using a bridge on mm. its head a little bit. So subdued chorus and then epic anthemic bridge at the end of the song mm -hmm. as opposed to just sort of coming in as a little eight bar thing. But you know what strikes me is it's still working with conventional song forms, but mm. just flipping the conventions or expectations of what the sections should sound like in relation to each other. But it's not like completely different. You can still yeah. identify the different yeah. sections of the songs yeah. and understand them in relationship to each other and hear the chorus as the chorus, even though it's a mm. subdued chorus and hear the bridge mm. as a bridge, even though it's like a big anthemic bridge. And it makes sense. Mm. You know, sometimes people mess with the structure of a song and it's interesting, but it doesn't feel like a song. Mm. It doesn't feel like it's working with the conventions. This mm. song is a, is a classic. It's an iconic song. Mm. It absolutely makes sense, but it just does it differently. 
mm. at various points along the way. The next song that I want to talk about is the song Why Georgia by John Mayer. So what we'll do is we'll play the first verse to this song and then I'll tell you what it is about this song that I learned about great lyric writing. Okay. What I learned about lyric writing from this song, I really learned from songwriting teacher Andrea Stolpe, who's written a great book called Popular Lyric Writing. And what she talks about in that book is the difference between internal language and external language, and how important it is to achieve a balance of internal and external. So external language is really the language of description and scene setting, so that we have a vivid and specific picture of an actual character in an actual space. We get a sense of the physical world of the song. So in this song, the lines, I'm driving up 85, is pure external. It tells us situational narrative detail. Mm -hmm. It situates the singer of the song in a physical space. We can see him. And then we have the line, in the kind of morning that lasts all afternoon. Now, this starts to blend external with internal. So internal language is the language of thought and feeling, reflection and insight. It's emotional language. It's not necessarily tied to something physical. It's describing an emotional state or a thought. So there's a bit of external with reference to the morning, that's something vivid and specific, but the kind of morning that lasts all afternoon is a thought, right? That's explaining some way that it feels. So that's a blend of external and internal. And then we get a pure internal line just stuck inside the gloom. So that is just describing an emotional state. So already we have this pattern of external mixed language, internal and then the same pattern repeats in this song four more exits to my apartment pure external hmm. but i am tempted to keep the car and drive it's a blend because i'm tempted is an emotional statement to keep the car and drive tells us something physical brings us back to the situation and leave it all behind now that's pure internal because it's just telling us what the thought of the character is so again when we look at the pattern of this song, we have external mixed internal, external mixed internal. Now, this is a pure balanced blend of external and internal. But what is the effect? Why would we do this? Well, as songwriters, we have very limited time to engage and connect with a listener and make them care enough about the song. The thing about external language is that when you conjure imagery, it is actually one of the fastest ways to connect to a listener. If they can see the singer or the character of the song in a physical place, it's like they're in a movie scene, right? It's like a good opening scene of a movie. You immediately suspend your disbelief, you're right there. And it opens the door to the feeling. But then blending it with the internal language gives us an immediate sense of why we care. Mm. And not only that, in this particular song, we are given the sense of the emotional crisis of the song mm. in that first verse. So we really understand what the fundamental problem is for this character driving, literally and metaphorically, um, the whole kind of narrative of this song. Mm. So this idea of blending external and internal language is something that I learned from this song and something that I strive to achieve in every one of my songs. I want listeners to know in my first verse, sometimes even in the first two lines, to be honest, of a song, not only to get a sense of what the imagery is, get a sense of a physical space, but to understand what the emotional problem, tension or conflict is that is driving the need to sing this song in the first place. That's great. 
So, next song I want to talk about is a song by Tom Waits. Good. Love Tom Waits. Uh, the song is Big Joe and Phantom 309. Odd title. And you hear it and you go, what on earth is Big Joe and Phantom 309? And I guess for me, this was a song that really showed me that you don't have to write conventional songs, that you can have hybrid songs that are kind of half poetry, half traditional you know, songs or storytelling. Tom Waits is one of those people, I think, who keeps reinventing himself. He goes through different phases. He goes through different genres. He doesn't seem to be bound by any expectations, limitations, parameters, or genres. And so this song really, for me, it, it sounds like a poem. It sounds like someone sitting around the campfire telling a story, and yet it's set to music, and it's, it's just incredibly immersive. What I really learned from this song, I think, is storytelling is such a primal part of who we are. It is such a compelling, you know, part of our lives. It's such a, it's such a powerful thing. You know, someone says, let me tell you a story and you're interested. You don't even know what, you know, what it's about. You don't really care. Tom Waits, I think, takes us on these journeys and he really puts storytelling at the heart of his songs. So for me, that was a big deal because I learned to play guitar as a kid. Um, we've just been talking about John Mayer's song where the riff comes in and, and it feels like the riff sets us up and then he takes us on this journey. I was always inclined to write songs with the guitar first and make it very guitaristic. And listening to Tom Waits as a kid made me realize you could just tell a story and, and the music will join the party later, but the story was there as the core element, the core offering of what it was about. If we look at the breakdown of this set of lyrics, you'll see that it is linear, it's top to bottom. It doesn't have that classic kind of song form where there are repeated sections that you keep, you know, doubling back on. He, he has repeatable phrases. He mentions Big Joe and Phantom 309 throughout, but it really does feel like a linear piece of storytelling top to bottom. And the other thing that Tom Waits is masterful at is he doesn't say it the way everyone else says it. He seems to deliberately go out of his way to take the cliche line, the common line, the, the, the usual phrase, and twist it enough so that you've never quite heard it that way. Is there an example of that? So the first one that sticks out is, I got tired of just roaming and bumming around, so I started thumbing my way back to my old hometown. And following on from what you were saying before with the John Mayer example, this idea of thumbing my way, I mean, we all know what that is because we can see it. So he paints the visual. Thumbing my way back means, you know, hitchhiking. It's mm -hmm. the universal symbol for hitchhiking. But he doesn't say, I started hitchhiking my way back. Started or even started making my way. No, none of that. He just gives you the gesture. He, he gives you the show don't tell mm. principle. Which is also about the really nice choice of a beautiful verb. And if you want a little bit more discussion on mm. the choice use of excellent verbs, you can check out this video. So thumbing my way back to my old hometown gives us this image of a, a young Tom Waits standing on the side of the road, desperate to get home, but he doesn't use the word hitching, he doesn't use the word making, he doesn't use any of that, he just gives you the visual. The second beautiful example of this is when we see Tom Waits get into the truck. So Big Joe pulls up alongside you know, Tom Waits and his truck is called Phantom 309. So this is the whole point of the story. It's, it's about Big Joe and his truck called Phantom 309. Tom Waits gets in, they strike up a conversation and Tom Waits starts just describing the inside of the cab. And he says, I smoked up all his viceroys as we rolled along. He pushed her ahead with 10 forward gears. Man, that dashboard was lit like the old Madame LaRue pinball. Again, so much visual information. You know, not I smoked all these cigarettes, but I smoked up all his viceroys. He gives you the specific type or the specific brand of cigarette. The dashboard lit up like Madame LaRue pinball. It's so visual and so unusual that it sticks. And I remember hearing this as a kid going, I don't know what some of these references are, but I want to know. I, I want to find out because it, it felt so immersive. It felt like I was there in the truck with them, you know, watching this story unfold. And then as the story moves on, it does what all good stories should do, which is it gains weight. It builds gravitas and momentum and it starts to mean more than it did when it started out. It starts out as a, a simple hitchhiking story and it turns into something 
far more serious with, with some beautiful messages, you know, interwoven. But you have this moment where Big Joe drops him off just before it a bend in the road just before a turn in the road. Big Joe says, I just got to drop you off here. And Tom Waits sort of gets out and he's a bit shocked by it. And Big Joe flings him this, tosses him this coin. And so uh, Tom Waits walks into the truck stop and he orders him, he says, I, I ordered me up a cup of mud. Again, like who says that? He didn't order a strong black coffee. He ordered it up a cup of mud saying Big Joe's setting this dude up. It's like, oh yeah, okay. It's just so, it's so colloquial. It's so vivid. The best line in the whole thing, though, the, the line that really just made me fall in love with Tom Waits. When Tom Waits orders his coffee, he said, this, uh, this is on Big Joe. And everyone in the diner stops because what we find out in the story is that Big Joe is dead. Big Joe turned his wheel at that crossroads a long time ago and he turned his wheel to save a bunch of school kids who were crossing the road. And the truck went into a skid and he crashed and Big Joe died. So we've got a ghost story that we've only just found out as a ghost story. And so he says, you know, I've got this dime that I want to buy a coffee with. And everyone says, OK, you hold on to that dime because this happens every now and then. And the guy who owns the diner says this happens every now and then when the moon is holding water. And this was the line. This for me was the line that changed everything because Poets for centuries have been trying to say full moon in unusual ways. They've been trying to talk about the fullness of the moon or, you know, the roundness of the moon, the swelling of the moon, all of these different things. Tom Waits comes out and says full moon to make it a reference to the fact that we've got a ghost story in play. But he doesn't say full. He says when the moon is holding water because we know that the moon affects water. We know that it affects the tides. We know that it relates to the female body. Mm -hmm. And there is a cyclical nature to the way we talk about phases and, and water and all of these different things. So again, it's the omission of the obvious statement that is the genius of Tom Waits. It's not saying the thing that you expect him to say or, or the thing that most people would say. And I would, I would say that that is the big takeaway, that if you, if you can find a way, if you can work a little bit harder to take a cliche line and just find the other way to say it, the way mm. that no one else is going to say it, mm. you endear yourself to your audience. Mm. And, and it only takes one line. Yeah. We don't have to have every line being a zinger. This one line bought Tom Waits 10 years of my loyalty. You know, I, I fell in love with Tom Waits because of this one line, it, it, because he showed that he cared so much about his craft that he worked hard to find this beautiful non-cliché. I mean, that's one of the things that I tell my students all the time is that you are no longer allowed to use clichés unless you are twisting them mm. in some way or subverting the expectation of the cliché. So there are tons of examples from even songwriters like Taylor Swift. I think that she's a master of this. Instead of just using the cliché, she'll twist it in some way. So instead of saying time flies, she says time won't fly in the song all too well. Mm. And it's those little twists that take something familiar that has prepackaged meaning, but then sort of springs it back in your face and makes it more interesting and compelling mm. because it contains some unexpected variation. So you can do this in your own writing by even looking through a book of idioms or um, yeah, like you can get the American Heritage Dictionary of Idioms or I'm sure mm. there are mm. online versions. Devil's Dictionary is a great one as well. Okay, good. Yeah, I've never seen one. I'll have to look it up. But uh, you know, you find these cliches. So for example, if you took something like the conversation flowed. Okay, well that's a cliche because it's a sort of dead metaphor you know it, it is a metaphor but we don't really see the imagery of flowing water mm, anymore mm, mm. also the expectation of that cliche is the conversation was easy mm. right but ways that we can freshen up a cliche like that is saying something like as the conversation flowed I drowned in all the misunderstanding between us mm. so now yeah. it uses the word drowned that brings back the imagery of some kind of river flowing, but also subverts the expectation of the cliche because mm. now it no longer means the conversation was easy. It mm. means the conversation was difficult. Or you could say, you know, the conversation flowed like honey or you use something really viscous. 
it sounds like it's going to be the cliche, but then you say something that's actually really sticky and it, yes. it gives this sense of, oh, this oh I love that. And it's slowly moving. You it's know. also, you can't quite tell whether that means <laughs> it was a sweet conversation or whether it was a really slow and difficult conversation. Or both. Yeah. yeah. Sweet <laughs> yeah. but slow moving. Yeah, yeah. It's got nice ambiguity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The last song that I want to talk about is the song One More Dollar by Gillian Welch. What I really learned from this song was one of the most significant concepts in lyric writing for me, which is the concept of verse development and recolouring the chorus. So let's play it and then mm. I'll talk about it after. Great. One, two, three, four. <laughs> me so much about verse development. So let's start there. There are two really important points to make about verse development. One important point is that each verse should present new ideas, new material, new plot points, should grow in weight 
and not merely be a restatement of the same idea simply using different words or different imagery. So this song is a particular type of song. It's a narrative song and not all songs are narrative songs. But the same rule applies even in non-narrative songs. We don't simply want to start with the biggest idea and then just be reiterating that idea throughout the song. We actually want there to be a beginning, a middle and an end. Escalating the conflict, problem or tension throughout the course of the song. So this does it in a narrative way, but it can do the same thing in any song. And so I think about that with every single song that I write. The second thing that this song taught me is a concept called recolouring the chorus, which is a concept taught to me by Pat Patterson. The concept here is that a chorus lyric is a section of lyric that repeats its lyrics which presents a problem because how do you repeat something without it just sounding like you're repeating a punchline to a joke? You don't want it to simply get less interesting, you want it to get more interesting. The way that you do that is by thinking about two things. One thing is about the chorus itself. So phrasing the chorus, finding a title and finding words in the chorus that can actually withstand repetition and also be recolored, which means approached from different angles throughout the progression of the verses and still make sense, still be a meaningful response to the problem presented in each sort of increasingly problematic verse. And then the second thing is the verses themselves need to do the job of recoloring. So you want to make sure that each verse can actually present new ideas that's reframing the ideas contained in the chorus. In this particular song this happens in two ways. One way is the image of money itself. So Gillian Welch very deliberately and carefully uses the imagery of money in each verse to symbolise the changing state of the protagonist. In the first verse it's the image of wages being sent home. So when we hear one more dime, one more dollar, we understand that to mean the wages being sent home. Mm. The second verse presents the image of the character gambling. So they've lost their job, they're taking this massive risk gambling at the bar downtown. So we hear gambling, and now when we hear the lyrics, one more dollar, one more dime, we're no longer hearing wages, we're hearing and seeing money being gambled at the bar downtown. And then the final verse presents our protagonist in the present moment. We understand that the character is in fact now homeless, destitute, and begging for coin on the street. And so now the image of money is being used to show us someone begging so that when we hear one more dime, one more dollar, we understand that being the words of someone begging for money. Mm. So not only does the image shift and change and reframe how we understand the dime and the dollar, what that actually represents, but most importantly, the litmus test for great verse development and great recolouring is how the emotion changes. Mm. So the first time we hear that chorus, we get a sense of hope and optimism. The second time we hear the chorus, we hear desperation in the words, one more dime, one more dollar. And the third time we hear resignation, <laughs> right? And so it's the same words being sung every single time, yet it refers to a different image, right? Different kind of money imagery, but more importantly, it feels mm. different. And again, it's a concept that I reach for and often fail, but you know, it's in the reaching where we like achieve something that I reach for with every song that I write. The last song we want to talk about is Dire Straits' Romeo and Juliet. What a song. What a songwriter. Mark Knopfler is, I think, one of those songwriters who doesn't get talked about much. Doesn't get mentioned in, you know, the discussions about great songwriters. But for me, he is, he is an amazing songwriter because he, he found a way, I think, to balance all of these beautiful elements. Great guitar work, great musicianship from the whole band, beautiful structures. A lot of diversity in his songs. And then you have this song, Romeo and Juliet, which is really just very sweet. And it's, it's got this beautiful intro, which is the part I want to talk about first. So the intro of Romeo and Juliet arguably is the most famous part of the song, uh, which in is, it, that's in itself a little bit odd. It's not the main melody. It's not the chorus of the song. It's this little intro that he, that he plays that I'll play for you now.
So that's the intro, or something like that. That's close. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not quite what Mark Knopfler wrote, but that intro, as soon as people hear it, the first, the first moment, you know the song, you recognize the song, and it's this beautiful little melody that's separate from the rest of the song. And by that I mean it's not the main melody, it's not the chorus. You hear it, and within a second you recognize the song, and people love that intro. You know, you always see when people are listening to this song, that little intro brings a smile to everyone's face. And that for me was quite an eye-opening experience as a kid because I just always thought you started a song with, you know, maybe the chorus chords or just holding a chord, you know, four bars of just holding a static chord and then into the song. It was the first time I'd heard a, a melodic section or a whole idea on its own written to be the intro. And it's the first time I'd heard it so effectively done. So that in itself is interesting. But then you realize that he's written about a 400 year old story. And again, this was one of those things where I think I heard uh, Billy Collins talk about this in his masterclass, you know, that he had studied a poet who wrote a poem about Elvis. And he said, I didn't realize you were allowed to write poems about Elvis. I thought poetry was meant to be about other things. And he's like, well, I'm going to write one about Fats Domino then, or, you know. And it's this idea that Mark Knopfler's taken a 400-year-old story, a very famous 400-year-old story, Romeo and Juliet, everyone knows it, and he's brought it into contemporary storytelling. He's turned it into a pop song. Mm -hmm. And he started off with, you know, the lyrics, a love-struck Romeo sings a street sus serenade, laying everybody low with a love song that he made. This idea of telling the story of the story almost, you know, it, it gets a bit meta. And yet the thing I love about Mark Knopfler and this song in particular is it never takes itself too seriously. As it develops into the, the chorus, it's kind of playful, tongue in cheek about the timing being wrong. So I think the most valuable thing I, I took away from this really is the idea that a song doesn't have to be about whatever happened today or yesterday or it doesn't have to be about what's happening in your life or someone else's life that you've just been speaking to. This idea that songs can draw from anywhere, they can draw from a 400 year old story, they can draw from a poem you've just read, a movie you've just watched. Uh, that idea is huge because I think as songwriters, we do feel the burden of having to come up with the material all ourselves. It all has to come from our experience and it has to be all you know about us. and. That, there's a huge amount of pressure in that. Mm. So that's a big deal to be able to say, well, I can draw from all of these other sources and repurpose them into song form. Mm. One more thing about this song was it's in open tuning. And you only find that out when you try and play it, when you, when you actually sit down to learn how to play it. And that, that riff, by the way, is it's difficult. I, I was playing around with it yesterday and it, sh it shocked me that it sounds simple and yet getting your fingers around it, it is hard, it's difficult. And even just then, it's, it's difficult to play. There's a beautiful lesson in that, that when you get something to sound easy and, and in fact be very difficult to execute or perform, you've done something right. You've done something well, whether it be a lyric or a melodic idea. And the fact that it's also in open tuning for anyone who's looking for a way to break out of old patterns, looking for a way to try something new, if you play guitar, you should be playing with open tunings. Mm. I had never experienced open tunings or experimented with open tunings. It's not like piano. You've got this stringed instrument where you can turn the tuners. You should do it. There mm. are so many amazing open tunings out there. And I, I discovered this whole new way of playing guitar and this whole new way of constructing melodies as soon as I experimented with open tunings. Mm. And I just think that's a great way to break any kind of rut, any kind of cycle. Awesome. Mm. I know this video was long and thank you for sticking with it if you did. <laughs> Maybe you didn't. Maybe we're talking to no one. <laughs> but hopefully you can see through our discussion of these six songs that taught us something really significant about how to write songs. That songwriting is not something you just have to wait around until the golden 
call of the gods strikes you one day. Um, you know, you can really actively seek out tools, techniques, practices, methods, ways of thinking, chord progressions, mm. lyric structure, all that kind of stuff. There's always something to borrow from well-written songs. And not only borrow, but steal. Okay, and so I just want to reference a book here that is one of my go-to references as a songwriter, as a teacher. I am constantly reading this book and thinking about it and talking about it. And it's the book Steal Like an Artist by Austin Kleon. Mm. Okay, so it's a tiny little book and you can literally read it in about 45 minutes, but it was mind opening to me. Um, and one of the most beautiful quotes in here, there are so many, but one of the best in here is a David Bowie quote where he says, the only stuff I'll listen to is the stuff I can steal from. And it's packed with artists and writers and athletes and all kinds of people, scientists and stuff, all talking about how they learned their craft by actively trying to steal mm. the stuff of their heroes. The book goes into more detail about what is good theft versus bad theft. And it's not okay just to imitate, but it's different um, to try and emulate something, which is really trying to steal not the thing itself, but the thinking behind the thing, mm. right? And that to me is so important. That's good theft, is stealing the thinking not the thing. Um, but really what we're showing you here is us stealing like artists, is looking at things and extracting the things that really um, enliven us about what we've listened to and thinking about how we can transform that into our own songwriting and put it through all our own filters and have it come out sounding like us, not like the artists that we love, mm. um, but ultimately, especially when you're cross-pollinating and blending your references and, you know, objects of theft, <laughs> you know, you're going to come out with something that sounds like you, not mm. like the thing you've stolen from. So, yeah. And we get squeamish about this. I think a lot in conversation, it comes up that people are quite uncomfortable with this idea. But I think it's important to remember that every artist who has ever lived has done this. This is actually part of being an artist. It's not... It's, it's not taboo, it's crucial. And and it's it's yeah, any honest artist who has yeah. lived would say the same thing. Yeah, we all have our heroes growing up, we all have our icons, people we aspire to. It makes sense that you then go and study them and immerse yourself in them and absorb them, you mm. know, and start to emulate parts of what they do. That's what every good, you know, artist has ever done. So it's important we have the discussion out in the open and just acknowledge that that's, that's how we grow, that's how we learn. Mm.